Hi, all, and welcome to today's live stream on Waco, um, the tragedy that occurred there 20 or almost 31 years ago um, in Waco, Texas, at the Branch Davidian Complex. There's been, obviously, it was high profile in the news, um, so people who were adults at that time watched it happen, um, and since then, there's been a lot of documentaries, a lot of um you know, information released and 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 things, all kinds of things about it. So we are uh, talking about that today as our topic. And I'm so excited that we have Naomi and Lindsay here because of their joint um, experience and insight that they bring to this subject. Um, Naomi, obviously, is our founder and executive director, um, who uh, has also been, all three of us have actually been on site too. So we have that perspective to at the actual complex. Um, but uh, Naomi's insight and perspective from a, um, uh, leader in this on this topic about religious abuse and about cults and and all kinds of things that happen on that front and then um, what that means for the future which is what we're going to talk about and then Lindsay has done quite a bit of extensive research and um, working you know interacting with people um, on the Branch Davidian compound and everything so really excited to have both of their knowledge of speaking into this topic today um, and it is a live Q&A, so we welcome your questions in the chat. Please um, feel free to put questions in there at any point. And if you're watching this on replay, welcome. We're so glad you're here. And please feel free to put any questions or comments you have in the comments section. We'd love to know your thoughts and get back to you when we can. So Naomi and Lindsay, I have a couple of questions prepared to get the conversation going. And I, I trust it will be a dynamic, rich endeavor here. Um, but do you have any opening words that you want to share before we dive in? I think, Lindsay, you're not probably going to love that this is my first comment, but aren't you considered a world religions expert? <laughs> I don't know who gave me that title. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but uh, I know a lot about world religions. And mm -hmm. so I guess I don't know that that makes me an expert. I don't have a Ph.D. in world religion. I would love to get a Ph.D. in world religion. Um, from my mouth to God's ears. Um, I have no doubt that you'd love to get a PhD in a lot of things. <laughs> yes. Um, that, you know, I, I thought of actually going to um, a program at University of Austin um, a few years back uh, to study with someone who actually specializes in cults. And, and then another door opened and I sort of veered away from that path. But um, it's always been sort of in the back of my brain that I should maybe go get a PhD in in religion, religion and world religion. Um, but I, I I don't know. I hesitate to use the word expert because uh, there are like 10,000 religions. And so it would be really hard to be an expert in all of them. But I do know a little bit about a few of them and a lot about a few of them. Um, so take that with what you, what you may. Well, and the reason I bring that up is because it is part of the reason, not the whole reason, because Lindsay is just lovely, as everyone can tell. But part of the reason why I love having you on to have these conversations is because Lindsay digs deep in research to really do the best possible to understand what on earth happened and what are the beliefs and how did those influence decisions made. And so knowing that she went into that rabbit hole for what happened in Waco back in 93 is, again, why we'd want her to be here to have this conversation. Yeah. So I will leave that there. But I wanted to give a little bit of more of an intro um, of just the asset that Lindsay is to these conversations. I'm very appreciative for her to be a part of them. Thanks. Absolutely. It's going to be good. So let's dive in. Um, so for those of you watching who may not have a working knowledge of what happened in Waco, um, in 1992, um, right, 1993, Three. sorry, <clears throat> said it again, okay. 1993, you know, what, uh, what is the summary of, of the significant events that everyone should know coming to this conversation? So I actually think it does start in 92, but not with the Branch Davidians. It starts with Ruby Ridge, which was an event that happened um, in Idaho in August of 1992. And uh, there was a cabin in the woods uh, where some things, um, ATF got involved. The ATF is the federal um, arm of alcohol, uh, tobacco, and firearms. Uh, and they uh, led um, sort of a, they marched into this cabin in Idaho. And unfortunately, uh, a child and um, well, a son and a wife died um, in that incident. 
And uh, the Branch Davidians, meanwhile, while they were in Waco, were watching this unfold on the screen like many people throughout the country were watching it and kind of wondering, why was this happening? Why was, you know, why were people getting shot and killed for having sort of extreme beliefs? Um, Ruby Ridge, um, uh, the the family that was living there did have extreme beliefs and they did have firearms, uh, but, but we live in a, a country that allows people to possess firearms, so why was this a problem? Um, and that conversation then led to, well, now we're in Waco. Um, uh, some people speculate that the FBI and the ATF were trying to make up for the mishap that happened at Ruby Ridge in 92. They wanted to make up for that and show that they could actually manage an issue that was happening. Uh, they caught wind that there was this uh, religious group. They had called it a cult almost from the very beginning, uh, a religious group that existed uh, a, about 15 minutes away from Waco in an area called Elk. Uh, so it's not actually in Waco. Um, one of the documentaries that I saw um, actually said they used Waco in all of the media uh, things because wackos from Waco sounded better than wackos from Elk. Um, and so that's really disturbing that that was even on the table um, on why they would use Waco as the location. Um, for those of us who are familiar with what happened um, at Columbine, for example, that didn't actually happen in Littleton. Uh, but everybody always says, oh, it happened in Littleton. Uh, no, that, that didn't actually happen in Littleton. Um, so we, we're being specific on location because some people think that it happened directly in Waco, but it did not. It was out in the country. Uh, there was this small organization, about 117 adults and roughly 40 children um, lived on this compound uh, that they had built up themselves. Uh, and they were living pretty peacefully. I've talked to some adults who grew up in the area who remember them being like in the like the homeschool co-op or, um, you know, they shopped at the same Walmart or they they frequented the same restaurants as some of the Branch Davidians. And um, you'll see that they had a good relationship with the local sheriff. Like there were there were just relationships that they, they belonged in that area. Um, uh, well, they caught the attention of the federal government because word on the street was that they were um, gathering weapons. Uh, what happened was the UPS driver was delivering some mail and a couple of grenades fell out of the mail. Uh, and he reported that uh, and said, yeah, so some grenade shells have dropped out of this box uh, that I was delivering to this, this place outside of Waco. Uh, maybe you should look into that. And uh, so then it, it they found out that they had been buying weapons uh, at various gun shows, which, you know, if you're from Texas, you know, that's not unusual. If you're into guns, you're buying guns and you're going to gun shows. And um, if you're not into guns, you know, people who are into guns and you know that that's what they do. And um, and and so the, the fear was that this group was um, gathering weapons to maybe fight somebody. Uh, the, the ultimate fear was that perhaps we would get another Jonestown um, and there would be a mass suicide situation. Um, and so in uh, February of 1993, uh, they executed a search warrant uh, to uh, go on to the compound. Uh, they had already had a, an undercover agent sort of go into the compound and get to know some of the people who lived there, including David Koresh. Um, and uh, they they went to go execute the search warrant, but they had a whole bunch of firepower with them while they were doing this. And uh, the the Branch Davidians knew that they were coming. Uh, and so despite warnings that maybe they should call it off, they did not. So the ATF went in guns blazing. It's uncertain who fired first. Uh, depends on which side you talk to. Um, but uh, there was a major gun battle that happened on that initial day uh, in February of 93. And then there was a standoff for 51 days um, until, of course, we we know that it ended in the ultimate tragedy of um, a fire and uh, 80 or so Branch Davidians lost their lives, adults um, and 25 kids uh, died in that fire as well. Uh, and so I think I think it's a really important thing to know a couple of things because um, history matters. Uh, I mentioned Ruby Ridge. There was a there was a person who was observing all of this 
happening. And his name was Timothy McVeigh, who was a war veteran. He had served in um, the Gulf, uh, the Gulf War. And he uh, observed what happened at Ruby Ridge and caught wind of what was happening in Waco. Remember, it was a 51 day standoff. So he actually drove to Waco. Um, and there are, is video and photos of him just kind of camped out with every all the other civilians outside of uh, the compound. And uh, he was selling bumper stickers, uh, 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 pro-gun, anti-government bumper stickers, because at this point he was like, the government is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So he watched the whole thing happen. Um, and then, as we know, a couple of years later, on the same day that the flames took over the compound at the Branch Davidian complex, uh, he executed, I mean, he he performed the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, and so I think uh, history is important because people are watching these groups and people are watching how others are responding to these groups. Um, and it's not to say that, uh, I, I'm not taking a perspective as, as to who is at fault in this situation um, and whether it's, I mean, obviously Timothy McVeigh is at, at fault for the damage that he did, but as far as government or Branch Davidians causing the whole ruckus, um, that's not for me to say. There are opinions on all sides of the, of the coin, but um, we do need to know that people who have already tendencies to think certain ways um, will have confirmation bias and um, everything that happens will confirm in their minds things about mm -hmm. government officials or or whatever. And that perpetuates over time and decisions that are made have impacts in the future. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I think you already started to kind of lead into the next question, which Naomi, I'd love to hear your thoughts too, but like why we're talking about this. I mean, we're coming up on 31 years since the fire happened on April 19th, 1992. Three and um, and isn't this all in the past? Like they're the, they're not there anymore. Like are the branch events? Are they still even a thing? Like why is it important to be talking about this today? Yeah, well, the branch of Indians definitely still exist. And Lindsay, I'll let you jump in on that too. But yes, um, and I, it's still it's still a thing for a lot of reasons. And yes, Lindsay, you just spoke to some of it. Like the history connects the pieces, different pieces connect and they inform future incidents in all ways as well. Hopefully how things are handled in the future, hopefully it informs that. Um, but it also still matters um, because there's still survivors who are alive right now and they are still living out of massive trauma and still trying to make their lives work and they have lost their families they've lost their loved ones and they are trying to still continue on and that's that's horrifying to think about and so this isn't like so ancient history that you couldn't be w walking by someone and just not know that it's them uh, people are still living and, and walking around and I think it's important when i zoom out and i go more like macro kind of big picture because there are such similarities. We have these common denominators across the way different groups function when we're looking at um, groups that are, are living in these different ways. And in, in some respects, it can be peaceful, people making decisions for how they live. And it's like, okay, like we could just, people can agree to disagree and we can let them be. And then there's other similarities that I would see, for example, like with Waco, where we have someone saying like i'm jesus and people are gonna follow him to the death and very literally so and we the more we understand about that kind of mentality i think the more informed we can be in the steps we're going to take and how we're going to take them and i think that was part of what was so so difficult for me and watching the various documentaries um, I think the most, the newest one that I had watched was the Netflix one, which is still like, is that a year old now? Or is it two years old? I'm not even sure. I feel like it was spring of last year, but it's a more so recent one. Um, and just hearing again and hearing different, you know, testimonials because the docu-series of how people responded and what they thought. I'm like, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm just like almost constantly over and over again thinking they do not understand this mentality. They right. do not understand this mentality. 
of course this was going to happen or of course that wouldn't have happened or and it's just like just not understanding what they were actually getting into and how this was likely going to go down and the more we can be educated about such things the more effective we can actually be in causing the least amount of harm that's great, Naomi. Yeah. yeah and it, that Netflix documentary, which is also the one that I watched, um, was released a year ago. Uh, exactly, actually. So um, we actually have a question in the chat here, and it kind of, I think, ties into just understanding history, like you mentioned, Lindsay, and understanding like what um, <clears throat> what what maybe was most compelling or significant about the events that occurred. And like you said, Naomi, uh, of course, this was going to happen. So maybe we can speak to that here. The question is, 51 days seems like a long time. Is that an abnormal amount of time for a federal standoff? Uh, I'm Yeah, my understanding is yes, yeah, that was a too. long time. Uh, there were, so there were, um, and, and documentaries often don't share the whole story. So watching documentaries, sorry, my voice is like crazy right now. Um, watching documentaries will sometimes not give you the full picture of, of what happened. But from what we can tell, there were two ideas working in the FBI group. One wanted to just go in and infiltrate right at the beginning. Let's just get it done. Go get the guns and that's it. It'll be done in a day. And the other was let's negotiate. Let's let's try to get them out peacefully. Um, and so over the, the first couple of weeks, there was some movement, right? Um, uh, David Koresh at one point, he promised that if his views on the seven seals were released on national news, he would, they would all come out. Um, but then of course, as often happens with modern day prophets, he had a revelation from God that told him that he could, that they weren't going to leave after all. Um, there was also some movement. Um, at one point, uh, the women who were nursing stopped producing milk because of the stress and, and all the things that were happening. And so they asked the government for milk. Um, and uh, that that was that was something that happened fairly early on. And then it sort of just there were some incidents throughout those 51 days, but every day wasn't like intense. Uh, it was a lot of watching. At one point, uh, the, the FBI got antsy and they cut the power and then they started shining really bright lights into the building and playing obnoxious like torture music um, at all hours of the day uh, and, and really just inflicting more trauma, trying to get them to come out was the goal. Like they can't withstand this. And then tear gas canisters toward the end were thrown in and that, they'll definitely come out now. And they didn't, um, and and then um, and then of course at the end, even with the fire, uh, which we don't know really who started the fire, depends on who you talk to. Um, with the fire, surely they're going to all come out, and and they didn't. Tragically, the many of the women and children were were stuck in a vault and couldn't come out, uh, but uh, they were trapped, uh, which is is devastating. Um, and then the others just decided not to come out. David Koresh actually died from a gunshot wound. Um, and we don't know if that was self-inflicted or if he had somebody do that for him. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say 51 days is probably unusual, which is why it caught the attention of so many people. Ruby Ridge was shorter, but it was still longer than than normal. Um, and and that caught attention. Like, what is what is the government doing? Um, and is this the way we do things? Uh, and I don't know that we have an answer for that because it's not happened frequently mm -hmm. historically. Like we don't, we don't have a lot of Wacos happening. Um, and, and, uh, we could, and I think maybe, maybe things have been resolved differently, uh, with some groups. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would say 51 days is probably long, but of course I'm not an expert on that topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just pulled up Ruby Ridge to see. And I mean, this is just the initial Google result. But yeah, it's showing the dates. That was 10 days. Yeah. So just to give a comparison point of, yeah, 51's a lot. Um, and keep also, in mind that at, 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 the, at the complex, they didn't have running water. Mm -hmm. uh, they were living um, off the grid. 
They they did have it depends. They had access to electricity. Um, they didn't often use electricity, um, but they did sometimes. Um, it, it was, you know, they were living uh, quietly away from society. So um, there, it was hard for FBI to be like, well, we're going to do this. Well, they don't already have water. So cutting water is not going to do much for them. Um, or we're going to cut access to, to it. Well, they don't, they don't need to get cut access to that because they don't have that. Uh, so it was a little bit more complicated, I think, um, for, for government officials who wanted to resolve it because there wasn't a lot they could negotiate with. Um, and, and eventually they were able to negotiate the release of some children and some adults. Uh, but David Koresh wouldn't let any of his wives or children leave the compound. So um, they all uh, died in the compound. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I mean, every eligible, as in what, 14 and older female would have been his wife. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and, and this is where I think it's important for people to understand sort of the mindset. Like, mm -hmm. what do you mean they didn't come out? Like, why wouldn't they come out? Well, they they truly thought that what the government was doing was proving everything that David had been teaching for the so last perfectly years. lined up. It was and like he had predicted so the tanks are even going to yeah. come. Yeah. And literally tanks came. Right. Yeah. And so if you're if you're part of this group and you already believe that that David is this is Christ like figure and, and his predictions are coming true and that now the fifth seal, which we can talk about in a little bit, has been opened just like he said it would be, you're not going to leave because you've bought into it and you're going to stay. The, there were some women who wanted to leave um, with their kids and a couple did. A couple did leave uh, and, and, you know, th that they're, they're still believers. Uh, some right. of them are still believers um, because they, they really believed this all confirmed everything David said um, and everything David taught. Now, David was was an interesting fellow. He'd actually been excommunicated communicated from the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, and had been told to go join this branch Davidian group. Um, and, and, and he did. Uh, and, and that's when, you know, as he started amassing men and married couples, the conversation would be like, we're going to be a celibate commune except for me, but I'll only have um, sex with, with, with my wives, which I'm actually going to take your wife as my wife. Um, and we're only going to have sex, not for my pleasure. Uh, that was a big thing for him, not for my pleasure, but to procreate. Um, and he really wanted to, to create the kingdom of God with his own offspring because he, he believed that this was what he was supposed to do. Uh, some speculate that he had the entire, well, he claimed that he had the entire Bible memorized, um, uh, that I don't know. I didn't know him. Uh, so I don't know if he did. Uh, I will say that I've heard reports that he just seemed to have a really deep knowledge of scripture, um, and, and did under, like, did have it memorized. He, uh, he would just quote scripture freely. Um, but I, you know, his interpretation of scripture is really why, you know, the group mm -hmm. congregated and, and grew in that area. And there were a lot of non-Americans uh, in their group as well. A lot of people had immigrated from other countries uh, and um, other places uh, to join the Branch Davidian group and, and live under David's um, authority. Yeah. And as someone who grew up in a cult that thought, you know, I thought I was would have lived the end time end day at this point like that it as someone who grew up in that um if i wouldn't have come out yeah it's just it's the truth mm -hmm. um there's no way i would have come out mm -hmm. again that was so perfectly what was happening was so perfect it's just like the most unfortunate thing how well it aligned with what had already been taught and so it didn't even re really require like twists and turns. And I know what happened when my dad died, when I was taught he wasn't supposed to be able to die. Like we had to do some twists there to like be like, oh my gosh, like kind of like a new revelation sort of thing. Yep. No new revelation was even required for this. Nope. It just all fit perfectly into place. And so 
And I see even what family of mine has done, you know, continuing on and how it does continue on. And I'm like, I would have believed that if I left, I was going to hell. Mm -hmm. That I was actually denying Christ, that I was like Peter. But that it like that's what it would have been taught. You know, that's would have been my perception. And so no, I wouldn't have come out. Um, and I think again, that's eh, now in all fairness, again, I'm not picking side the both sides, just the, the just the whole big bots job in yes. so so many directions. And one thing that stood out to me from the um, I don't know if that was with the negotiators was And really like, and I get being hopeful, but and really thinking that they're all actually going to come out. And it's just like, and I remember someone said, um, I read a quote by someone um, who was in one of those positions who was like, well, if I had done this or if I did, you know, like people reliving it day after day, I'm like, I wish that they could lay that down because I wish I could talk to them. They weren't going to come out. I mean, and I think that's proven because wherever the spire started, whomever actually started it, people still didn't all choose to come out. I mean, we have we have a report from someone who saw somebody and said, take their gas mask off and let themselves die. Like they were not going to do it. And the the true tragedy is ultimately at the end of the day, I'm like, I don't, I don't, we say like people have free will, they get to make a choice. When we start talking about indoctrination like that, undue influence like that, it starts to get really muddy. But when we're talking about kids, that's pretty crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And that is the most devastating part. And Lindsay and Natasha, I know we've all gone to Mount Carmel and and had conversations and been there. And when you see the wall with the names and you see how young some of these kiddos Mm -hmm. were, who didn't actually have a choice. They wouldn't have been able to have a choice. And yet at this, there's no win here because the kids who did leave are now growing up with this as their family story and there's no way that they're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the more devastating, so I've, I've been to Mark Carmel. It's three or four times. I'm not real sure. Um, the first time was when we first moved to Waco uh, in 2019, right after seminary. And, uh, my girls were in school and Jay said, Hey, what do you want to do for your birthday? And I said, I would really like to go visit Mount Carmel. Um, and he said, that's a unique choice. (laughs) And, uh, so we went, we drove out to Mount Carmel, not sure that we were going to be able to access, like go and see it. Just like, I wanted to see it. I grew up in Texas. Like this was the thing. Um, and driving on, we were, we were able to see it. So uh, they say there's, there's conflicting signs when you yeah. enter the grounds. Mm-hmm. Um, one sign says no trespassing and the other says visitors welcome. And so you're really not sure which one you should decide to, to, to believe. Um, but we went for visitors welcome. We're, we've got no problem. Like, let's just, let's go see. Um, and we drove really slow because we were just really uncertain of like what we were, what, what we're driving on to. And when you when you drive on to Mount Carmel, Branch Davidians still live there. Um, I, I think people need to understand, like, there, there are still people who live there who, who um, follow uh, Branch Davidian beliefs. Uh, and there are some buildings uh, along the way. And then it leads you, the path sort of leads you to the chapel, <clears throat> which was rebuilt. Uh, so this is an interesting fact that I uncovered. Uh, some of you might recognize the name um, Alex Jones. Alex Jones is like an alt-right conspiracy theorist. Uh, he's had said some really things. He said some interesting things about like the Sandy Hook shootings um, and actually had to pay a sum. I think I think he was found liable for having to pay a sum and whatnot uh, to the Sandy Hook survivors. Uh, he has had some interesting conspiracy theories about 9-11, about the whole Oklahoma City bombings. Well, he's from Austin. And at the time, um, he was like a, a radio DJ in Austin. And so you watch this whole thing come down, go down. Uh, he actually fundraised to rebuild the chapel on, on the grounds uh, at Mount Carmel. So um, that was really interesting revelation to me as I was like, wow, Alex Jones, really? Um, but so, so he, this major conspiracy theorist helped fund the chapel that is there today. Um, And the the main family that lives there, uh, 
uh, the guy claims that he's the leader now. His name is Charles Pace. Um, and um, I've actually interacted with him. Um, I think a couple of times, I think the time that I went with my parents, uh, I think we had a pretty extensive conversation with him. Um, and you can go into the chapel and it's, it's available. Like if there were going to be services, there could be services there, but on the back wall, it's also, um, like a, a mini museum. Uh, that's the best way that I can describe it. It has, a uh, sort of a place that's dedicated to David Koresh. Um, and then there's a place, like you said, with the victims, it's like a panel with all of the, the, the images and then, um, a bunch of stuff about the U S government, like it's just a whole bunch of stuff about the U S government. And you could spend a, a good hour to just reading all of the information, uh, that's available in the chapel. And then plus, if you have conversations, you learn a lot. Um, uh, for example, uh, Charles Pace does not believe that David Koresh was who he says he was. Um, and, and doesn't believe he really was a prophet, um, and, and, and thinks that all was not accurate. Um, Pace wasn't there on the day he had lived there previously and was living away at the time. And then he came back and he's been living there, um, for a couple of decades, I think. Um, and then you can kind of walk on the grounds and the experience is interesting because you see a school bus like in the bushes. If you're looking, you'll see the school bus. Um, and then there's an area that, that is labeled the vault and it's literally where the women and children died, which that was like the hardest part for me to stumble across um, on, on the grounds because um, that's, that's awful. Um, and, and, and that'll get you. There's also a memorial to the victims of Timothy McVeigh on the grounds. There's a, there's a, there's like a, uh, many, it's a memorial to them, mm -hmm. um, because they don't believe that Timothy McVeigh was in the right. Um, and even though he was motivated by what happened there, uh, it, it and I would encourage people, uh, if they choose, because it's like on TripAdvisor, like it's one of the top things to do if you go visit Waco is to go out to the Branch Davidian Complex, Mount Carmel. I would encourage people to, of course, approach it as as, as what it is. It's a memorial, right? So mm -hmm. we're not taking selfies of ourselves at this chapel, like, oh, look where I am today. This, this is a, a place where uh, more than, you know, 80 people died. Um, and in a tragic situation. Um, and so you're also not entering with the mindset like you're going to change their minds. Or um, I would recommend you go there with a desire to learn more um, and um, just understand a little bit more and a little bit better about what happened and maybe even learn more about their beliefs if you were to go visit. Um, and of course, with respect, lots of respect. Yeah, it was, it's really hard to go see. Uh -huh. um, it's overwhelming in the chapel. So I don't know. Oh, I think we just went in January and it's actually like all, except for the, you know, straight ahead wall where they'd have the podium and everything. All three walls are like covered. Yeah. There's so much. so much. And <clears throat> I realized after going backwards that it is a timeline. If you go the other way <laughs> and you start on one wall and you can go all the way around. Yes. And pretty, it was interesting because it was pretty solidly like seemed like solid information, like mm -hmm. not the super bias, not super, like from what I was reading for a while, it was just like, here's the history of this person. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all flattering. Um, for David crushes that actually had that he had set an administrative building or something like that on fire. Mm -hmm. at one, and I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. that's incriminating. Yep. Um, I, I don't know if he started this fire or not, but like, that's interesting information to consider. Yeah. Um, so he's not anti fire starting anyway. Um, I think that might be fair at least to say. And so just like things like that. And they've said, you know, he married this 14 year old and he did this and he, and so it's like, okay, like this is all written here. And so I appreciated that just here's information. Yeah. And then there was more of the, the current beliefs about things about the U S government and all of that. And 
and they had handed us this sheet when we pulled in. Um, it's just like this dual sided mm -hmm. paper and all of the, you know, kind of government stuff. Um, and it actually says like Waco, a new revelation. Mm -hmm. And the part that I want to talk about for this is again, going bigger picture not, uh, you know, Waco is, is an example of newer revelation, mm -hmm. but new revelation in more um, high control or more like extremist type groups is incredibly common mm -hmm. when there's that spiritual element, whether it's a spin off Christianity or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we see this escalation and Waco is in our only example. Jonestown is in our only example. There's a lot of examples and there are many situations going on right in the U S right now where through being bold and we're coming alongside people who have left and the trajectory does not look good. <clears throat> it's not good when we hear of everyone, their group activity every week is to go and shoot and get really good at shooting. You know, those are the sorts of things where it's like, okay, like what are, is it just a hobby? Well, you've got 70 year olds doing it who have never held a gun. That's not really a hobby. Like what are people training for? And can people absolutely, yes, they can go train so they can shoot, so they can protect their families and things like that. And yet I think it, it can cause concern and I think that's fair because we do want to learn from history. And again, we want to learn from history and the approaches that also did not work and what we, the, the major changes that need to be made there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in regards to this new revelation thing, whenever I hear that like special revelation used wrongly, or we have new revelation, that is a huge pause point of like, wait, hold on. Sometimes it's called new light or um, yes as well. There's a couple of mm -hmm. a, a couple of current religions that use new light instead of new, re new revelation. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think in this situation, specifically with Waco, what it made me wonder, and I, I, I'm not saying that this is for sure. This is just kind of where like, as from my own situation and other conversations I've had not directly connected with Waco, Anyone, and I'm curious from the conversations you've had with people with um, Branch Davidians at the at Mount Carmel, if if maybe they've touched on this at all. They, I don't have the impression that in general they're in support of David, who he said he was, what he did, like that they're saying no. Um, that is not reflective of who we are, mm -hmm. and to have that association with them mm -hmm. for so long. That that's burdens burdensome and it's deeply unfortunate because they they are not living this lifestyle. Like this is not what it looks like for them. And so it's unfair to continue to connect it with them. And when I saw the new revelation stuff where it's like, well, but David Crush actually came upon all of these weapons that the Clinton administration was hiding. And so he was actually the hero. And so, no, we don't agree that he was the Christ, but he was actually a hero because he was trying to do the right thing. And so all of this is also on the walls and some of that's on the page. And I'm like, is this like a, okay, we finally don't have to carry that anymore because he was actually a good guy. He just took it too far. It's like, what are, what are we trying to mentally do um, in order to like maybe give ourselves a sense of peace and rest and just be able to move forward in a way we haven't been able to? What do you think about that, Lindsay? So I think new revelation keeps people in the group, right? Mm -hmm. So all the, all the leader has to do is say, I had a revelation from God and, and uh, um, none of you can have sex anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to marry all your wives and that's it. No. And, and, and people willingly did this with, without question, which is, um, you know, but they'd bought in so much to this end times philosophy. Um, it, it, it's, it's an apocalyptic group, right? So uh, they, they are fully bought into um, the seven seals as described in Revelation 6 and, and who's going to usher them in. And it's hard 
to tell them that it's wrong. So one of the problems with the negotiators and 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 trying to negotiate with with Steve, who was um, David Crush's right hand guy, and David himself, is how do you argue with God? If if they believe that God has told yeah. them to do these things, how are we going to even compete with that? What what do we have to offer that can compete with with God? Um. And uh, the the problem, one of the problems with New Revelation is, and and organizations and, minist- and uh, religions that that buy into New Revelation is anything can be said in New Revelation, mm-hmm. um, and it can and it can lead to intense tragedies like Jonestown, right? Like this mm-hmm. revelation that we're all going to drink the Kool Aid. Sorry to Kool Aid. It was it's like a purple drink, um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, like we're all going to drink this and this is the revelation that we're living under and it's going to fulfill the prophecy. Um, and, and, and I think, so there's a, there's a, some branch Davidians who believe that David Crush still was the guy, like as he, as he predicted, uh, as he said he was. Um, uh, so his name isn't actually David Crush. Uh, it, it is, that's the name he, he chose for himself. Um, and, and it's after King David and King Cyrus in the Bible. So it's, it's a biblical name that he chose. Um, he's actually Vernon Howell, um, which is not David Koresh. Uh, but I think I think when people are buying into the things that David says, and they're already living at this commune, and the guy can spout off scripture, and uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, so people said that he was like mild-mannered generally. Uh, now, Discipline was a problem. Mm-hmm. There, there, there are definitely incidences that were described about, you know, what would happen if somebody needed discipline. Um, but in general, the guy was approachable, as cult leaders typically are. Uh, you don't join a cult if you know that the leader's not like if he's a wackadoodle or she's a wackadoodle. You're probably not going to join them. Um, but uh, he was mild mannered. He had Steve, who had a PhD in theology. He had been teaching at like the University of Hawaii. And he had bought into what David was selling. Um, and so now you've got this guy who you had lawyers who had who had given up their careers to go live with it and follow David. Um, so you've got these educated people who are now following um, this leader who, who makes these pretty extreme claims at some times. And then you see them start to be confirmed by actions mm-hmm. of other people. And you can't you can't argue with that. Um especially if the leader claims it's just all God. Um, and, and that gives leaders a lot of control. Um, and who are gripped by that either, either stay in that and that's going to be where they land. Um, or, um, there's something that tickles their brain, uh, that says maybe something's off here. Um, and, and maybe I, I I shouldn't be here anymore and they leave but um, they're often shunned or uh, they lose their whole community, their whole family, because oftentimes cults are called families, like you're one big family. We're a family living here together. We're all in this together. Uh, you know, I think at one point, one of the surviving children said it was like I had a hundred moms. Um, and, and who wouldn't, you know, that, that's, you know, and uh, one of the things that, you know, it was, it was just when, when you're so tied to that, you're going to trust all of the new revelation that is said by the leader. And, and it's going to be really hard for you to break off of that. Um, and if you do break away, you're probably not going to buy into anything. Or it's going to be a really hard battle for you to understand truth and reality. Um, and you're mm-hmm. not going to let yourself trust people maybe as freely as you did before. Um, sometimes shame comes with that, right? Like, I can't believe I bought into that. We talked about that with uh, the twin flames. Like, I, I think we have to be really careful when we're trying to show people truth who have bought into new revelation because yeah. it's a really tricky, like, how do we prove it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Especially when in their yeah. minds, it's been proven. Right. Yeah. Which is, I think relates to what Naomi was saying about there's yeah. no way they were going to leave. You can't. And like the, right. the FBI, the negotiators, they didn't get that. And that's part of why it was such a botch because there was nothing they could argue against that. And so there's actually a question I think that relates to this. Um, that do you do oh, your Amanda. Own- Hi, I Amanda. know. 
Amanda, thanks for being on here with us. Uh, that leads me to, 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 does the FBI have or consult with the religious scholars in, in other similar situations? I mean, wouldn't that be great? I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know if you guys know, but like there was a gap there, right? That if they knew how people's brains were working, maybe things would have been differently, but they, they didn't. So have they learned? I don't know. You know, I'm wondering like if there's some sort of training now that they can go through or that they do go through. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't research that. Um, it's an interesting question. And maybe that explains why we haven't had a, a replay of that um, sort of incident. But I, I, yeah, that would be a good idea um, to always have uh, somebody in your back pocket if you're dealing with a, with an extreme religious group. Um, yeah. I know that people are brought in because I know I've been reached out to you about coming in for like court cases, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that there are people who are trained as like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. anti-terrorist people who work for the government, things like that, where they're more aware of this kind of a high control mentality. The religious aspect, though, depending on which religion it's connected with and trying to kind of decipher that and figure it out. I don't know if there are people that they bring in with Waco specifically. It seems like from what I've heard and read and Lindsay, feel free to jump in if you have anything different. Um, it seems like it was really viewed as a hostage situation mm -hmm. and so they were approaching it from that mm -hmm. angle, which was a huge miss from the start because none of them were hostages in the way that people would have been thinking about it. They were hostages <laughs> in a way, but many of them, it started at birth that they were hostaged. And so they, they would have never known that. And it would have mm -hmm. never been viewed that way. Again, we weren't looking at people who wanted to leave and just, and some of the mistakes that were made, like, the mom, Kathy, who came out and then had a few minutes with her child and then was, you know, put in jail. Um, and they knew that they knew that happened. It's like, well, no, no one, are you kidding me? Of course, no one's going, going to come out. Um, and there had to have been another way to handle that. Um, keep her on the house arrest or something, you know, for a while, like whatever needs to be done. I'm not getting into like all those weeds and details, but like, that was not the moment, you know, to make a decision right. like that decision. And, and even seeing the lack of compassion from some of the stories of the children who came out who are like, it just, there should have been a team. Mm -hmm. We needed a whole team of support for those kiddos. Um, mm -hmm. because from their worldview, this was all wrong that they were not with their family. I mean, that's for any kid, but with their, what they had been taught and even what they're being reminded of on the way out the door to remember and on the phone to remember and all of these other variables, like, and then they're just like left on the floor to like play. And, uh, you know, and uh, Heather, one of the women, I think it was her who shared that, like her stuff was just like knifed open and they're just chatting. Like she's not there. You know, this is, this is now a memory for her decades later. <laughs> and, the lack of the lack of understanding is is just absolutely massive um and i hope that there's been improvement i hope that if we find ourselves with anything again where there's concern where it makes the news and we're aware of it you know that uh, people have learned and that there are they know who to call there's other people to bring in um for aftercare as well for everyone um, again, in different docu series and stuff, you see even the the torture of people on the other side who were working with ATF, who are working with FBI, who they're haunted by this. Um, at least some of them are, and I just wonder, like, what what care have people gotten? I just I think from my profession and where I sit, I just like want to just sit with them all <laughs> and just come alongside them um, as, as far as they're able to go in this life mm -hmm. um, because that journey is painful and it's isolating and it is an incredibly, incredibly difficult one. Um, and so I, it takes bravery and courage for anyone to go on it. And um, the less of it that we have to do alone, uh, the better it, it helps us to heal, to have someone safe that can companion with us in that journey. And so 
again, a lot of mistakes in all directions who actually did this versus that. I agree with you, Lindsay. I don't, I don't even have a personal stance. Mm -hmm. I genuinely don't even have one that I'm unwilling to share. I just am like, I, I don't even, only the person who did it actually knows. Um, I just think that it's just really tough to be able to know otherwise. Um, but I think ultimately what matters is that people have died and people have been the people who have survived are still deeply wounded and, and carry pains forward. And I think the mentality that we see as well in some survivors reminds me of other situations like Heaven's Gate would be an example of people who are like, almost like they missed out, like they mm -hmm. shouldn't have left, like they were in the wrong. And we see some of that still today. Like some of the the quotes um, are really difficult to read, um, to see the the mentality that is still being held to and just knowing mm -hmm. how it doesn't actually align with scripture. And I think that's, mm -hmm. I want to boil it back down to there. Um, if someone had come to them who was a biblical scholar and started trying to have uh, religious related conversations in the negotiations, would that have done anything different? Probably not. Honestly, at that point, I think it was too far. Like mm -hmm. we were too far in the narrative for it to work at that time. But we know um, when we, and we can know when we hear things like this, that no, this doesn't align with scripture. Um, me having sex with David Koresh would not be like me having a tender moment with my God. That's not what that is. That is right. so twisted. Like it's just flat out satanic. It is that ugly. It is that twisted. That is not what being the the bride of Christ means. It is not a sexualized concept. And so when I hear things like this, I'm like, oh my God, like my heart's breaking. It's this right. is not what Christianity actually says. And so if people want to claim a different religion with those beliefs, they have the choice to do that. And yet, please, let's not confuse this with biblical Christianity. Right. Well, I think, I think we're, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever heard somebody say the branch Davidians are Christians, um, which is interesting now that I think about it. Um, because usually if you have a cult, uh, that is a, a break off of Christianity or a Christian denomination, or, I mean, but this is really a, a break off of seventh day Adventist, which is different. Um, and we've seen actually a lot of cult groups break off of Seventh-day Adventists, which is um, an interesting discussion for another day. Um, but I, I think as Christians, uh, truth has to be paramount. And we have to be able to, to recognize when truth is being twisted. Uh, but we won't be able to do that if we don't know truth. And we won't know truth if we're not reading scripture, if we're not in a Bible teaching church. Uh, if, you know, if, if we're just watching these things for entertainment, uh, and, and we're interested because like, where are they now? Right? Like, I mean, I do that too. I wanted to know what happened with David Thibodeau, who's one of the main characters. And, uh, he, he wrote a, me a memoir, but he was also heavily featured in, uh, the Paramount mm -hmm. version, uh, that featured Taylor Kitsch as, um, David Koresh. And, uh, you know, I wanted to know, like, where's where's th this kid? Because he lived. What happened to him? Um, and he he still every every year, I think, like hosts a a reunion of some sort at Mount Carmel on the day as, as sort of a memorial service. Um, and he's he he has like a Waco survivors group, and um, because. I mean, ultimately, there, there's fallout uh, and people like to talk about the government fallout and what does this mean? But the fallout really is in these people's hearts and these people's minds. Um, and the kids, one of the kids, uh, survivors, uh, she was nine when it happened and she talks about how she like heard the bullets go through people and, and what that did for her. And, and so now you're taking somebody who's, who's learned twisted scripture their whole lives and the people that they've been warned against are actually killing them mm -hmm. for what they've been told they believe. Um, it, it, they're not, you know, and how as an adult do you cope with that reality if you're, you know, 40 years old and um, 
what where does that leave you uh as as a as a believer what what do you believe in do you believe in nothing um and i, I think it's i think those are the kinds of conversations that um we have to be having uh when things like this happen or as we discuss these things because it's not just a wacko from waco right mm -hmm. like this is a no. human being who who had some beliefs who who brought people in with him to to also have those beliefs and and how can we come alongside the survivors and and the people who've been affected you know even even people who who live in Waco today who saw it you know mm -hmm. not just on the news but like saw the fire, you know, and, 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 and saw it happen. There's a certain level of trauma there too. Um, Absolutely. recognizing that, you know, those are 80 people dying in that building. Um, mm -hmm. so we have to have a certain sensitivity, but we have to also stand firm in this is Christian truth. Uh, and, 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 uh, this is, you know, the branch Davidians don't subscribe to Orthodox Christianity. And, and what we believe scripture says about things. Um, and we certainly don't believe David Koresh, you know, ushered in the fifth seal. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we do believe Jesus Christ is returning, but it's it's not quite the way that the Branch Davidians have taught. And, and certainly the new revelation thing, we have to be careful um, if we ever hear um, a, a, a prophet, a modern day prophet talking like that. Uh, that should send some red flags up about, yeah. ooh, what do you mm -hmm. mean by that? <laughs> totally. What do you mean by that? I mean, there's some good discussion in the chat right now, just defining what does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to be pseudo-Christian? You know, how how if, if someone's being called a Christ or identifying as a Christ, does that mean they're a Christian? So defining terms is so important in any kind of conversation around this. Um, gosh, this this definitely is so rich and could go on for a while. We are at the end of our time. So now, um, Naomi, I don't know if there's anything you want to close us out with just as far as why this matters, why we're talking about it, how this really impacts um, how we interact with people and, and, and the future that is held for, for everyone involved. I think, Lindsay, when we were first starting, you had used the word tragedy. And I agree in every in every way i mean this is a tragedy and i hope as with any conversation that we have about any group any topic any docu series or rabbit holes we go down whatever it may be i hope that we stay away from that sensationalism aspect that's something that i've been pretty hard on since the very beginning and um, love the team that I get to partner with um, who feel the same. And so I would encourage anyone out there who watches this or watches any of the any of the available materials, again, that you could go take a look at. Just remember, um, not to the point where you put yourself in those shoes, that's actually really dangerous. Don't do that. We can have a another form of trauma that can happen mm -hmm. from that. Don't imagine it's you. Um, but do remember that these are real people that suffered and they did not have the true freedom in Christ um, that is available to us. And that comes with a real depth of humility and of gratitude and hopefully of compassion while, like you said, Lindsay, also maintaining what is true. We don't, we don't need to move on truth and yet we can still have compassion. And that's my hope for every conversation that we have here and every person we interact with. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, everyone who engaged today and was watching. We're so glad that you uh, showed up. And if you have more questions or um, want to share thoughts, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, write a comment, send us an email. We will see you uh, at a future date for our next live stream. Um, topic to be announced. Um, thanks for being with us today. Bye.